Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. The title has come, Opportunities of the Manifest. The human effort <coughs> is based on the existence of experience and the experience of existence. So if this program of life has a dimension where existence is being experienced and experience is being existence, We can say that to zoom in <clears throat> on your existence is experiential. To zoom in on your experience is existential. You know, it, it feels like an opportunity for endless forms of life to express sorry guys I gotta change this song up it's too mellow <laughs> okay. There we are. I mean, here's the thing, every, every time I come to look at the idea of the human being, it's a certain pattern, it's a certain classification. If everything is in one moment, if everything is one existential event, then experience doesn't need to be really classified. Causally, it's one thing, in its effect, it's multidimensional. But if it was causally multiple things and its effect, it was singular, then the meaning of the singular would be different. That means we would wonder about the intelligence of the human being, potentially being... Um, it's as if your mind could be in a bunch of dimensions, but your body is in one dimension. Or we can say that the mind is multidimensional, so it is housing different bodies in different uh, subtler planes. When it came to yoga, when it came to the idea of the chakras, it was as if the chakras, of course, they, they were depicted as wheels, but at the same time, they were bodies, they were subtler bodies.
So it's kind of like thinking if the human being had seven different kinds of energetic body right now and each body having a different framework, different acknowledgement of the realm. Okay, uh, sorry guys, there was an interruption. Um, <clears throat> all right. I don't know, before giving the talk, I had this, uh, this vision that we can zoom in and out of experiences. If it's an endless cycle, it's this endless zooming in and out. And sometimes we're defining the problem by zooming into something, and we see the problem there, and then we zoom out. 
Now, opportunities of the manifest, what is the idea? It means we have manifested and we have manifested to ourselves. And that is a strange opportunity. <clears throat> now, in this opportunity, there's ways of looking at the life where the person may say it doesn't have a value. You know, that means the person cannot give it a value. It is more like a space of observation than life. That's more like just how the person is existing, a space of observation. <clears throat> now, the free will, the opportunity part, comes in what you fill in this space. And if, you, if the being realizes there is a value to their individualism, regardless of the collective outcome, you know, that means just because we're not the size of a star, it doesn't mean a human being cannot become a star, you know. So we are 8 billion manifest uh, complex uh, groups of cells. Being watered by light, <clears throat> sound, and simply mobility, these cells have developed identity. So we can say that as a complex, as a complex group of cells move in space or as they just move they accumulate information that means imagine just just a creature like a snowball effect of information occurring for the creature now that accumulation something begins to happen it builds 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 and what happens if you make a giant snowball i don't know how many people that have tried this in their like in my youth, I tried this a couple of times. I made it try to roll the giant snowball. And uh, what happens is that you either have to keep it going at a certain momentum or it breaks. Right? So I feel there was an incredible accumulation of information from these complex cells. <clears throat> And so the accumulation, just like the karma, it's like in a view on karma is that you have accumulated impressions from all these lives from as a as a transmigratory kind of attention. And so out of all that you've accumulated, what you are now and what your personality is right now is the fruits of the, this accumulation. <clears throat> so we are in an opportunity where cells have gathered around, started accumulating impressions, then have gone into phases of division, you know? So now the whole group is being redefined. So what, what's going on? It's like the cells, different cells in the body join. <clears throat> and then we have the tissue. So the small gathers together to be defined in a big way so it can experience the small of the big. <clears throat> so first we are the small of the small, then we try to be the small of the big, then we become the big of the small, then we become the big of the big. These are metaphors, I'm going to explain what I'm saying here, I'm just writing it down for myself so I can... <clears throat> So I think I've kind of found four ways that this can happen. Right now, we feel like a small thing in a big thing. <clears throat> there could have been a reality where we felt small in a small situation. Do you know? 
It wasn't a big universe. It was just small. Imagine if it was just the solar system, if it was just the Milky Way galaxy. Do you know? But that's not the case. Or imagine if it was just you as a human being were just hovering in space and it was only you here. <laughs> then there is the big and the small, which is unfathomable to us, but it would be the reverse. It would literally be if man and God's place were switched or man and the universal intelligence. If, if we, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a coin flip probability that this whole universe is like a creature it's alive or it's completely lifeless then we have the so we have the small and the small the small and the big what does that mean that means the microcosm limited to the microcosm the microcosm limited to the macrocosm the macrocosm limited to the microcosm the macrocosm uh, being as limitless as the macrocosm so it would be um, thinking of uh, there being different uh, hierarchies of selfhood um, from personal dimensions going to impersonal dimensions. We have, uh, let us say, the global, the global self. Let's say we have the individual self. first hierarchy, then we have the global self, then let's say the galactic self, Gal galactic self, and then the universal self. Now let us say accompanying these different types of self, there is a different type of sight, and the self cannot exist without a world. So when we go to find, look at the individual self, we're like, all right, what's the individual self's world? It's a world of duality, literally language and, of course, the singularity and the void. But duality is the peak of it, peak of the individual. That means you need duality to be individual. Um, <clears throat> the global self is, you can say, if the individual self has a physical world, the global self, it would be a global world, so it would be a world where it would be, we would have to imagine as if there had never been nations. There had never been division. It was just planetary. That means right now, let's say you feel an individual in a world, or let me say it like this. We have, let's say, um, the global self, the world is the planet. The galactic self would be a self that feels the galaxy <clears throat> is its home. That means if you went to another galaxy, you would feel like a stranger. Do you know? We're not at that state of mind yet. We're so defining by the colors that we have painted this face of the earth, this earth with that really I don't think a lot of people can fathom uh, any sort of identification as if with a different galaxy. Like people, do you know what I mean? That means even if we had some sort of hyperspeed kind of spacecraft to take us from one galaxy to another, that moment where the spacecraft goes outside of our galaxy and goes to another galaxy, it's like people don't even, wouldn't find that moment significant the way we're living now. And if we were to think of a universal self, the universal world where that self is, would be beyond the universe. That means by the time that you're a universal self, the universal self, in accordance to its own cell, uh, scale, will feel small. So that means what is big to us feels small to itself. So that's the way nature is, I feel. When we look at ourself, we feel 
are small. When we look at I'm trying to think it, think of it in the sense that <clears throat> what if we say a two-dimensional self or let's say a three-dimensional uh, how would I say this Okay, let's say we have a two-dimensional self, we have a two-dimensional world, and the two-dimensional world is simultaneously being the three di third-dimensional self. So the potential of two dimensions is three dimensions. The potential of three dimensions is four. Do you know what I mean? Of course, guys, excuse me here, because I'm writing on paper, so what I vocalize could be a bit fragmented now. But uh, <clears throat> pretty much I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if what we consider to be the non-dual state of a certain dimension, what if that could be the dual dimension of a more superior room? Because really, reality is being contained, right? Where it's not only physically contained by the laws of nature, but it is also ideolo ideologically contained by the laws of language, you know? That means when a person learns another language, it's as if they are finding another way the world can turn into image to them. Really, that's the study of knowledge. Every, everybody is looking at an unknown universal expression and we are extracting our individualism in accordance to how we engage it or what we do. <clears throat> so that's a crucial factor. This zooming in and out of life's program I mean, life does, I don't know, I mean, of course, many people can criticize this comment, but it, to me, it feels like a program. It feels like a roller coaster ride. You just open your eyes in the middle. There is no technical birth, awareness to birth. There is awareness to emergence, instant emergence, which is waking up, you know? So it's, we are, even though we are physically born, we wake up as an individual. And as the child goes on through life getting more experiences, that individualism becomes more layered. The more layers it has, the more complex of a human being you become. The more complex of a human being you become, the more, uh, more of a spectrum you have access to being a, pe a being, you know? Let us say that uh, just like a person, um, uh, uh, understands the meaning of new words think of like the more words you know the more ways you can express something the more freedom you have to express now it's the same with life but on an experiential level where the more experience when your experiential vocabulary is vast then your mind is not just based on linguistic um, out, uh, based on a linguistic outline. That means now, uh, I think a lot of people, they, there was this whole thing about cyberbullying and whatever, and I was like, what the f Like c cyberbullying in the sense of like digital uh, harshness. Do you know? <clears throat> and somebody, I remember reading somewhere online in this article, somebody was like, why don't these kids turn off their social media? <laughs> And I realized because people fear uh, being different than the world. They have zoomed in on something that is not their self. So this is why if the moment changes, they want to go with that um, normality. I'm telling you, normality is the most hilarious thing. 
you know, because it's never, there's no such thing as normal. What was normal back in the day is not normal now. What is normal now will not be normal in the future, you know. That means imagine, <laughs> imagine Edison made the light bulb and he showed his friends and his friends, some, some of his friends were like, holy shit, you're a genius. And some of his other friends were like, hey man, that's pretty unnormal making a light bulb. <laughs> you know, it's like there's something wrong with you, man, inventing a light bulb when we're all using candles. Like, you know, you're not normal, Edison. <laughs> You know, I do personally in my own life zoom in and out of what I consider to be objective focus realms and then subjective focus. The subjective focus means that it doesn't matter if my eyes are open, the imagery, the, the activity, the mental activity continues to occur. Do you know? But something that's limited to the outer realms, the moment your face turns, the moment your attention turns, that means you could be listening to someone, but if your head turns, there arises a new landscape that occupies your attention. <clears throat> you know? And eventually a person can become so sensitive that they'll start noticing what is hap why what is happening to them is happening to them. I'm telling you, this thing of cause and effect is very strangely accurate. Do you know? That one can look at exactly what's happening to them and know their karma. Know what they have done. Know why that's happening. <clears throat> you know, when you look at everything in, the, in nature, you see there's a strange balance. You know? You see the biological body heals itself. You know, you see that uh, <clears throat> there, there's something unique there. Now, if you thought that the mind of the human being was natural, could it be that the mind of the human being also heals itself? And sometimes healing itself for the mind is zooming out of the inefficiency that one had zoomed in at a certain point in their life. Because, you know, some people, they might need to, they might look at their life and be like, I have nothing. What is there to be grateful of? And some people realize just the, just the fact that their eyes are open to this program is a privilege. You know, it's astonishing. It's so fascinating, this slumber of acceptance of reality it's like language you know what it is language is like um, <clears throat> it's belief all of language is belief until there is an experience behind it that can synchronize with the language some ancient books, they were not meant to even be read like casually. Do you know some ancient books? Not that they weren't like, like it, it was wrong to read them, but it was that their meaning would only open if there was an intuitive rhythm. If, if literally your eyes moved before your mind. I've had this in, in regards to experiencing this with writing where I have literally just, I've only kept my eyes open enough to just see the page, you know, <clears throat> just a tiny bit open to keep, to see the page. The rest of it, I don't think about my, what I'm, uh, what, what I'm um, writing on the paper. All I'm experiencing in my inner realms is an emotional event, is some passage of imagery that leads to emotion. That emotion on its own 
is based on like how can I tell you instantaneous events that turn into words so what is going on is literally <clears throat> It's like a faster film is being played over a slower film. And one film has maybe, like if this was Photoshop, maybe 70% opacity. The other one has maybe like 30% opacity. So the matter makes us feel like mind isn't here. But in our dream states, we definitely know our mind is generating bodies for us where we're experiencing bodies and worlds where we're experiencing dreams. I had a dream once. This was uh, years ago, I think maybe 2007. Where I dreamed I was on an invisible vehicle. It was as if like some, some sort of strange, you know, bicycle that was invisible. And I remember it was as if I was holding this in the dream. I, this is a memory from a dream I had in 2007. And <clears throat> in that dream, literally it was like I was on this kind of like bicycle like vehicle that was purely invisible so technically if somebody was looking from outside they wouldn't see me on anything in the dream i was indoors and moving in the air you know between some place i, I um so there was an image of um how do i say it It's like a memory of a part of my grandmother's house in Iran where it was like this, what do you call it? Uh, like it's a, it was a special part of the house where in certain Iranian households, they don't touch one part of the house. One part of the house is left like for whenever there's guests, you know. <laughs> Anyways, in the dream, there was the experience of an invisible vehicle. Semi-flight, maybe like two, three meters into the air, but it was some sort of flight with an invisible axis, you can say. I don't know what it is. I think we have feared the invisible because of how abstraction has entered politics. You know, certain certain nations that have separated church and state. You know, but certain nations have not. And that's the thing. That's the thing that the word truth is always a heavy word. Even though when you experientially it's light, but the word is heavy. That means it's like any moment in any situation you look at someone and you're like, tell the truth. They, there is something about it that they can't, like, um, do you know what I mean? A person can't lie um, if certain moments of their life they have lived true and those moments define their uh, archetype in motion. <clears throat> I want to read for you some quotes from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. He says, <clears throat> What is evil? Whatever springs from weakness. <clears throat> Friedrich Nietzsche says, If you are too weak to give yourselves your own law, then a tyrant shall lay his yoke upon you and say, Obey, clench your teeth and obey, and all good and evil shall be drowned in obedience to him. <clears throat> Friedrich Nietzsche 
Friedrich Nietzsche says, Of all evil I deem you capable, therefore I want good from you. Verily I have often laughed at the weaklings who thought themselves good because they had claws. Friedrich Nietzsche says, A belief, however necessary it may be for the preservation of a species, has nothing to do with truth. The falseness of a judgment is not for us necessarily an objection to a judgment. The question is to what extent it is life-promoting, life-preserving, species-preserving, perhaps even species-cultivating. To recognize untruth as a condition of life, that certainly means resisting accustomed value feelings in a dangerous way. And the philosophy that risks this would be by that token alone place itself and the philosophy that risks this would by that token alone place itself beyond good and evil. You know, there is this thing in that certain philosophers point to, I think it's more, <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I, in my view, I treat Friedrich Nietzsche as a continental philosopher, but uh, sometimes it's as if, like, there is no way out, there is no truth, it's just something that experientially unlocks. There's a lot of philosophies that point to direct experience. And those who can't point to a direct experience, they ask indirect questions. Friedrich Nietzsche says, what we experience in, the, in dreams, assuming that we experience it often, belongs in the end just as much to the overall economy of our soul as anything experienced actually. We are richer or poorer on account of it. You know, this is an interesting point that uh, the type of experience you have suggests a sort of wealth for the character. Nietzsche says, free will appears unfettered, deliberate. It is boundlessly free, wandering the spirit. But fate is a necessity. Unless we believe that world history is a dream error, the unspeakable sorrows of mankind fantasies, and that we ourselves are, bought, are, are but the toys of our fantasies. Fate is the boundless force of opposition against free will. Free will without fate is just as unthinkable as spirit without reality. Good without evil. Only antithesis creates the quality. <sighs> what he means is like the space. And so Friedrich Nietzsche, I guess what he's doing... He's, he's trying to break the archetype of good and evil.
because their codependence means no longer they are significant. <clears throat> when you imagine there was a there there were people who worshipped the day and people who were uh, you know worship the night and then they're like what is this are we taking turns all the time like what would you know it would become a situation where they were codependent you couldn't worship the day without the night you know you couldn't fathom a planet without the space for it to be hovering in you know what i mean so here when it's, when nietzsche says only antithesis creates the quality so that means what is resist what is a challenge and a resistance to your life it's like information for the whole codependence of the duality again Nietzsche says, for all things are baptized at the font of eternity and beyond good and evil. Good and evil themselves, however, are but intervening shadows and damp afflictions and passing clouds. Frederick Nietzsche says, what is wanted, whether this is admitted or not, is nothing less than a fundamental remolding, indeed weakening, and abolition of the individual. One never tires of enumerating and indicating all that is evil and inimical, prodigal, costly, extravagant in the form individual existence is assumed hitherto. One hopes to manage more cheaply, more safely, and more equitably, more uniformly if there exist only large bodies in their members. I mean, if we make the small value less, I mean, if we make this, if we say the value of the small is less, everybody's going to try to be big, you know. But at the same time, the as above, so below doesn't really make a difference. Frederick Nietzsche says, when one speaks of humanity, the idea is fundamental that this is something which separates and distinguishes man from nature. In reality, however, there is no such separation. Natural qualities and those called truly, in quotations, human are inseparably grown together. Man, in his highest and noblest capacities, is wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, is wholly nature and embodies its uncanny dual character those of his abilities which are terrifying and considered inhuman may even be the fertile soul may be the fertile soul out of which alone all humanity can grow in impulse deed and work you know it's kind of like i feel like nietzsche is trying to philosophically justify his own guilt <laughs> But of course, his time was a very intense time, you know.
Friedrich Nietzsche says, It is indeed a fact that, in the midst of society and sociability, every evil inclination has to place itself under such great restraint. <clears throat> Done so many masks, lay itself so often on the pro, crusty and bed of virtue, that one could well speak of martyrdom of the evil man. In solitude all this falls away. He who is evil is at his most evil in solitude, which is where he is at his best, and thus to the eye of him who sees everywhere only a spectacle also at his most beautiful. You know, non-duality is a dismissal of duality. Unless there's something beyond non-duality and duality perceiving the moment. Nietzsche says, where the good begins, where the pow poor power of the eye can no longer see the evil impulse, as such, because it has become too subtle, man posits the realm of goodness, and the feeling that we have now entered the realm of goodness excites all those impulses which have been threatened and limited by the evil impulses, like the feeling of security, of comfort, of benevolence. Hence, the duller the eye, the more extensive the good. Hence, the eternal cheerfulness of the common people and of children. Hence, the gloominess and grief akin to a bad conscience of the great thinkers. You know what it is? It's kind of like human beings attempt good, then because they get to see the good, they may be going to see the bad. After they see the bad, only another good is left. I mean, you can say, like a person who is inside a vehicle, let's say your eyes open, you're a human being, Let's say this moment was like the first day you were here, for example. The first day on the earth. You'd see like control has to really do with how you are defining the meaning of your world to even extract an identity of self. Because this whole good and evil thing, the whole nature of duality is that there, that codependence renders each individual point void. So right now, it's as if, like, if I do something for myself, as if I haven't done something for the world. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like the self and world duality is... Um, What can be said? Srinu Sargadat Maharaj says diversity without separateness is the ultimate that the mind can touch. You know, sometimes the greatest thinkers stopped thinking in a certain way to see a new world of thought, you know. Here Nietzsche says, This sign I give you, every people speaks its tongue of good and evil, which the neighbor does not understand. It has invented its own language of customs and rights. You know, it's, it's fascinating, this distinction between the inner realms and outer realms that is so easy for us to see now, but back then it was so complex. Because what, what Friedrich Nietzsche is doing is he's starting from good and evil, then noticing people have inner realms and outer realms, so he's realizing some people have their own view on good and evil. So technically there is no such thing good and evil, because everybody is seeing their own 
meaning into the picture, you know? Nietzsche says to recognize untruth as a condition of life. That certainly means resisting accustomed value feelings in a dangerous way. Oh, no, I read this in the philosophy. Yeah. Nietzsche says, what is new, however, is always evil, being that which wants to conquer and overthrow the old boundary markers of the old pieties, and only what is old is good. The good men are in all ages those who dig the old thoughts, digging deep and getting them to bear fruit, the farmers of the spirit, but eventually all land is depleted, and the plowshare of evil must come again and again. The plowshare of evil must come again and again. How's Nietzsche looking at the world here? Um, so he's saying, he's saying, let's say, he says the good men are in all ages those who dig the old thoughts, digging deep and getting them to bear fruit. What he means is like you live for the good archetype, okay? And then you see at the end of it, where does the ultimate good have to go? That means when someone reaches the ultimate peak of good, all they can see is chaos. Just like how when you reach the ultimate peak of bad, all you can do is see the order. I think multidimensionality is the greatest salvation of man if it can be implemented to the linguistic simulation we're all characters in. Because for me, this matrix, the moving matrix, that matrix was language. Like literally on the screen, the matrix was code. It was language. So our language is like the codes on the matrix screen. So we can say if there was like a Imagine an extraterrestrial looking at human beings, like an advanced extraterrestrial species in the future, or from some parallel dimension, looking at human beings, and just seeing every sentence, every thought in our minds, like on a computer screen. You know, when you look at Earth, you just see every human being's thoughts, every, all the types of language going through people's minds, all the kinds of image as code on a screen of a higher dimension, you know. So I, I, I mean, Frederick Nietzsche, of course, was, was, was a thinker who had definitely noticed the depth of experience because the whole ability of being able to discuss good and evil, you have to have witnessed them. Nietzsche says, in laughter, all that is evil comes together, but is pronounced holy and absolved by its own bliss. Nietzsche says, the domestication, in brackets, the culture of man, does not go deep. Where it does go deep, at, it, where, where it does go deep, it at once becomes degeneration. And then in brackets, it's like type the, Chris, in, the Christian. 
The savage, in, in brackets or in moral terms, the evil man, is a return to nature and in a certain sense his recovery, his cure from culture. Yeah, you could totally see this is before the phase in history where people started to feel we were making a mistake. <clears throat> like industrial, heavy industrial mistakes. You know, Terence McKenna does say culture and ideology are not your friends, as if they are programs from outside of the real, the real you. Nietzsche says, some rule out of a lust for ruling, others so as not to be ruled. To these, it is merely the lesser of two evils. There's something missing from this quote, so let me move on. <clears throat> Nietzsche says, my brother, are war and battle evil? Necessary, however, is the evil. Necessary are the envy and the distrust and the backbiting among the virtues. Nietzsche says the great epochs of our life come when we gain the courage to be Christ in our evil as what is best in us. <clears throat> Nietzsche says I'm interested only in the relations of a people to the rearing of the individual man. And among the Greeks, the conditions were unusually favorable for the development of the individual, not by any means owing to the goodness of the people, but because of the struggles of their evil instincts. With the help of favorable measures, great individuals might be reared who would be both different from and higher than those who heretofore here have owned their existence to mere chance. Here we may still be hopeful in the rearing of exceptional men. <clears throat> oh, well, okay, he's saying, pretty much he's saying, with the help of favorable measures, great individuals might, uh, might be reared who would be both different from and higher than those who here, heretofore have owned their existence to mere chance. So um, that means uh, those people who have hope now as if there will be children born who will consciously live. All the things we're hoping for, they will come and consciously do. And then he says here, we may still be hopeful in the rearing of exceptional men. Do you know that means we don't have to per se create a perfect system. We have to create a system that its output of greatness is more than its inefficiency. You know, its efficiency is more than its inefficiency. Then it becomes self-sustaining.
Wow, Frederick Nietzsche says, and he who must be a creator in good and evil, verily he must be an annihilator first and demolish values. That means if you want to judge someone in a new, uh, from a certain type of good and evil uh, uh, perspective, you have to first reduce everything into zero and then judge him. <laughs> Nietzsche says the golden age when rambunctious spirits were regarded as the source of evil. <laughs> uh, Nietzsche says Zarathustra was the first to consider the fight of good and evil, the very wheel and the machinery of things, the transposition of morality into a metaphysical realm as a force, cause and end in itself is his work. Zarathustra created this most calamitous error, morality. Consequently, he must also be the first to recognize it. That's an incredible philosophical discussion. Is morality created? Is morality invented? Nietzsche says madness is the exception in individuals, but the rule in groups. Nietzsche says, Frederick Nietzsche says, that which an age considers evil is usually an unreasonable echo of what was formerly considered good, the atavism of an old ideal. Yeah, I've never heard this word in my life. All right, but <laughs> pretty much it just means counter, I think. A tendency to revert to something ancient or ancestral. Okay, this was not counter, or it, the atavism of an old ideal. Okay, the return of an old ideal, pretty much. That which an age considers evil is usually an unreasonable echo of that, of what was formerly considered good, the atavism of an old ideal. You know, if there was no free will, there would be no opportunity. It's only because we can implement, we can move the body, we can move the noise, the sound of the human being. We can generate sound. I mean, like, right now, it's kind of fascinating to me that 
cell, biological cells became so complex and sculpted by behavior patterns are now communicating in a linguistic realm as if they're completely free individuals. You know, Marcus Aurelius says the soul is dyed with the color of its thoughts. And the Japanese say a man is the room. The man, the man is the room he's in. That means it's like treating your life instead of one kind of self. A uh, general, general self that you're seeing like a line going through this arrow of time in this world. Instead, you're seeing that arrow, that line of time as endless dots and every moment being one of those dots, you know. As Heraclitus says, no man steps in the same river twice and it's not the same man and it's not the same river. <clears throat> so technically... If we don't have our attention on the past, or it could be that it's just layers and layers, and in their accumulation, they just build unique patterns. So imagine you put a bunch of horizontal layers, but suddenly in a vertical way, they have meaning. And this horizontal lines, but suddenly there's a vertical vertical uh, pattern you can extract from that. I thought of um, trying to use Aristotle's uh, four causes as lenses to look at just up here if, if you were just if you had just opened your eyes in this world suddenly as a manifest being what would the cause be so we look at the material cause we're like all right the cause is the actual physical particles we're made of then we look at the formal cause you know so we're like what is the material cause bio biological organic design you know then the formal cause, the geometry of uh, the physical universe, you can say. That's the formal cause why we're here.
So what does that mean? That means the material cause is seeing the atomic design. The formal cause is the geometry, the outline, what the atoms shape. So just the mere design, shape of the human being could be a cause regardless of the matter. But these are different causes. So the material, the material cause lens, let's say, from that lens, we, we see you, it's just the atoms hold the meaning of reality. From the formal cause, the shapes, the geometry, the evolutionary human being, you can say the formal cause suggests it. We have the efficient cause where I would say the religious perspective fits in here. And the it's in some sense if it was made for a utility, for a purpose, you know. Or sorry, I would say... I would say the efficient cause would be like just we are alive or um, okay let me go through this again we have the material cause Oh, I got it. I got it. The efficient and the final cause are like the cause and effect point of it. So what does that mean? That means from one dimension, we're looking at the matter, the, the par particles that are actually making up that thing, the, at the atoms, you know, the material. Uh, uh, then we see the cells, you can say. The, the, then we have the formal cause, the, g the design of the human being, literally who you see in the mirror, the shape of it, you know. Then we have the efficient cause, who made this, okay? Or we have this sort of notion of like, uh, how is, uh, it was because it's like as if it was the reason for the purpose, the, the, me, per, the meaning uh, was because of something before, okay? So the cause is the source of the meaning of something. Who made this, you know, God made us, you know, an empty universe made us, you know? Uh, a giant noise made <laughs> a pool of energy made us do you see what I mean so it's from the causal point we're wondering <clears throat> from the pure causal point that means that it's like what caused the cause of now you know another way here it shares it says the agency behind an object what's moving it you know i would say it, I, I, I would say it would be its utility but its utility maybe even in the moment or i would say agency is there a mind moving it that would be the cause or was it made by you can say it's like were we made for the purpose of some being that we can't fathom you know what i mean like then there is the final cause the final cause, which is the end result, that means it's destiny. That means we don't know the meaning of this until the end of it. You know, that could be the case. Here it's given a really good example. It says, for these four causes, imagine Aristotelian causes. <clears throat> so why something is. So the material cause here saying, imagine like for a house, you have the wood, bricks, and nails. And then the formal cause is the sketch, the architecture of the house. The efficient cause is the carpenter who builds it. The final cause, it's built for the people who are going to live in it. Perfect. <clears throat> 
So it's the same thing where we're looking, we're literally creatures that open our eyes in a world and we're like, oh my God, you know, the matter of the world, you know, the scientific method has gone towards that. Then we have the formal cause, you know, which I would say the philosophical method has went towards the formal cause, the design of reality, you know, the ideal subjective design of reality, you know. So um, we have the, the architecture of it, so, and then we have the efficient. So totally the meaning of life could be because of the person, the, the whatever forces simulated it, whether we consider it intelligent or not. It could have nothing to do with us. And the final cause is it's because it could have something to do with what we can't conceive now. So you see, pretty much, it's it's like, these are divisions. These are ways where Aristotle was like, okay, how can I see this thing has value? And in, on each of these levels, it has some sort of causal value. You know, you can associate some sort of meaning. The materialist, imagine the materialist perspective entertains a, a material cause. It's like it has no meaning. It's just stuff in space. You know, and then the formal cause is like, okay, no, we have an evolutionary design. Maybe there's, we should do something with the, the geometry of the implication of the opportunity of our existence is crucial. And then the efficient cause, of course, the religious mindset or a mindset that is leading it to the will of nature, pretty much. The divine will, nature's will, all these fall into the efficient cause. Or I would say the creator factor. Then the final cause is, I think this is the grand one. I think the final cause, that, that it's like you can't know the roller coaster ride until you're, you get to it to the end. You know, that's the beautiful thing about life. You want to see what this is. Because ideologically, people don't realize how rare it is to exist on a rock in the middle of nowhere at, in somewhere at all. You know, that's a... <laughs> so anyways, guys, we can zoom in, we can zoom out. You can zoom in in your inner realms, pretty much in meditation, you watch your mind. There's no, all those people were like, don't have thoughts, they had no idea what they were talking about. You know, it's the uh, thoughts are not something you have. They come and go. They're like weather. Your inner realms are like weather until you get to notice it. And then you can discriminate just like how you can tell your attention is like all those people who entertain a, a sort of deeper dimension to life. What does that mean? That means your experience surpasses, your personal experience surpasses the frameworks you have been exposed to so far. You know, so just like how the person feels, all right, I'm watching my objective existence and I'm noticing my subjective experience, right? So similarly, in your inner realms, the objective existence and the subjective experience is simultaneous. What does that mean? That means in your inner realms, objects appear as a subject instantaneously. This is why there's an unconditional ability where somebody could tell you, hey, visualize this, and you can instantly do it. You know? So as we get more and more acquainted with the space of our mind, the person not only has to accept what they are existentially in the mirror, you have to accept that instantly and then move on to the experiential domain. Right? So a lot of life after its conceptual teachings, it's just left for experience. And then as you take steps, it... Uh, uh, literally like a video game, it, you level up, insight arises. So the opportunities of the manifest is that 
the manifestation is the opportunity. <laughs> Literally, the, the talk's moral was zooming in and out of the talk. <laughs> But yeah, guys, I think there is so much to life. I feel uh, the species is going to soon realize the value of its inner realms and there's going to be a multidimensional renaissance of different human beings realizing it now is the only stage because the, the content of your inner realms, it comes and goes throughout the day. If you don't act on it, there's nothing done. Do you know, nothing, like literally it just comes and goes. That's the nature of the mind because the attention is mobile. We move. And uh, think of it this way, that every person's DNA being different, there is literally no teaching. It's just just like your nervous system, you know? <laughs> it's like somebody's like, oh man... I got problems, I'm stressed, man, what do I do? It's like, buddy, relax, it's all just your nervous system. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Anyways, guys, thanks. <laughs> Why are you suffering? Because of your nervous system. <laughs> Oh man, that's our existential dilemma is the funniest actually. <laughs> Anyways guys, thanks, thanks for listening. Watch blessings and all <laughs>